My name is Dr. David Schiffman. I am a marine conservation biologist who studies sharks and how to effectively conserve, manage, and protect them. So I've been studying sharks, uh, depending on how you count, a little more than a decade. I've been fascinated by sharks, and my, my parents say obsessed with sharks, my entire life. Uh, there are pictures of me when I was two and three years old wearing shark shirts and having shark toys. But I've been studying sharks professionally since about 2008. Not just studying the sharks, but studying the people and the socioeconomic and political contexts in which people operate. And that has long been identified as a priority for more effectively managing marine resources and conserving threatened species. But there aren't that many people who are actually doing it. My name is George Schellinger. And for about the last 20 years, I've been making documentaries about the ocean and specifically of late focused on sharks. The overfishing of top predators can cause a variety of ecological effects that are bad for all kinds of things in the ecosystem. So predators help keep the food chain in balance. When you talk about survival of the fittest, uh, predators are a big reason why the not fit don't survive. So it puts evolutionary pressure as well as population control on prey species and keeps them from growing, out of, uh, growing like crazy. The main job of a shark is to eat the, the disease, the dying, and the dumb. And, and that's what we say when we dive with them because you don't want to be dumb when you're in the water with a shark. Oceanic sharks have declined 70% in the last 50 years. This means they're heading for extinction if we don't stop. And, and part of that is a massive pressure from commercial fishing. Now, a lot of it is the fin trade too, but the problem now with sharks is a lot of shark meat is being used in a variety of products. And the shark fins are an offshoot of that. It's important to not overfish sharks, uh, as well as other uh, predatory fish like groupers or tuna, depending on where you are. But that doesn't mean that we can't ever fish for any sharks. It just means you have to strictly know, based on the best available science, how many can be harvested, as well as um, have strict laws regulating that. You really are relying on this apex predator for things you really can't because Sharks are long-lived, slow to sexual maturity. So when you wipe out the big ones, they're not gonna come back in our lifetime. So what shark finning is, is it's catching a shark and cutting the fins off of that shark, often but not necessarily while it's still alive, and discarding the carcass, the rest of the shark, which can be more than 95% of the total weight of the animal at sea, where if the animal's still alive, it will slowly bleed to death or drown over the course of about an hour. This is wildly inhumane, it's extremely unsustainable, uh, and it's also really, really hard to get accurate records on it. So this is pretty, this practice is pretty broadly condemned. Uh, and it's also been illegal in the United States. The problem is lots of people don't know that last part. They don't know that it's already not happening. Everything we create, we're thinking about the next generation. If, if we can somehow protect these creatures to where you know, my kids, their kids will be able to see them. Maybe there's hope that we can get this critical mass of the planet and the population to understand why they need to be protected. Look at the way sharks operate in the Atlantic Ocean and really in all oceans. You take something like a tiger shark. This is a highly migratory creature. So it's not just a U.S. shark, it's a shark from the Bahamas, it's a shark from Bermuda. They travel in all these international waters. The Guy Harvey Ocean Foundation tagged shortfin mako sharks off the coast of Mexico and off the coast of Ocean City, Maryland. We would spend a week on the water searching for shortfin mako sharks which are hard to come by. We'd, we'd get the shark, we'd tag the shark, put put the, the spot tag on so it reports to a satellite so we know where it's going. A shark tagged off the coast of Yucatan, Mexico, can go as far north as Nova Scotia. 
when they are heading that way, when they're heading to Nova Scotia, they're going right into the fishing grounds. The commercial fishermen may not be necessarily targeting a short fin mako shark, but if it hits a long line that's miles and miles long, that's it for the shark. 33% of our tag sharks were being taken in the commercial fishing trade. Well, we reported that, it was in one of our papers, and that helped change the way that short fin mako sharks are harvested or taken in the Atlantic. I mean, there's a sign. If 33% of your sharks are taken when you tag them, that means there's just not that many out there. You know, we, we would want that number to be so much lower, but but then again, it's, you know, it's almost a third of our sharks. And that, that led to some changes in fishing in, in the Atlantic. So shark finning is a very hot topic in the ocean conservation uh, advocacy world, especially among folks who are not necessarily professionally employed by an environmental nonprofit. People who are just regular concerned citizens who care about sharks and want to help. And there's a lot of uh, loaded language about shark finning, and there's a lot of major misunderstanding about what it means and it doesn't mean. Shark finning is to obtain the fins of sharks, which are made into a traditional delicacy in Southeast Asia and China and uh, those, those communities, diasporas around the world. It used to be consumed primarily by the emperor and his court, so it was a sign of wealth. And with the enormous uh, economic boom in China and Southeast Asia since the 1980s or so, there are now lots of people who are trying to show, look, I am as wealthy as the emperor used to be. As Westerners, we really don't want to, you know, approach their their culture and what's accepted and what's always been done. You really have to do it at the grassroots level and say, this is why eating shark fin soup is bad. This is why it shouldn't happen. One of the things we're trying to do is make people care about the creature and then bring the conservation side of it. Why do we, we try to explain why we do the science, why we are trying to protect the biodiversity in the ocean, kind of as, as sharks, again, as, as a poster child for uh, good ocean conservation. The, the actual shark fins, to make shark fin soup, there is a way of preparing them that basically what you're, you're eating in shark fin soup is the skeletal elements from the fin that are called serratotrichia. And they, they basically make a noodle-like substance that has no flavor and no nutritional value. But again, this is a, a, a sort of conspicuous consumption dish. This is, look how fancy I am, I can afford to eat this. This is another thing uh, related to shark fin. Some US-based environmentalists that I've spoken to about this have said that the idea of a grilled mako shark steak does not bother them, but a bowl of shark fin soup they find repulsive. From my perspective as a fisheries biologist, either way, you've got a dead shark there. Uh, it doesn't matter to me what happens after the shark is dead. We, what matters is limiting how many are dead. And, but if, if you find that a bowl of shark fin soup primarily consumed by Asians repulses you, but a grilled mako shark steak primarily consumed by Westerners is normal and fine, then your objection is not to killing sharks. Your objection is rooted in xenophobia or even over racism. Uh, the problem is too many sharks are being killed by unsustainable fisheries around the world, which are largely not here in the U.S. The problem is not specifically one product associated with that, though certainly that drives so If you're if you're getting ready to watch the news, you want to you want what they call a news tease that brings you in to watch it and. You know, talking about the decline of sharks, people, oh, I've heard this story before. You really have to say, hey guys, it's still happening. Nothing's really changed. And in fact, you know, if we don't change our ways, we really don't monitor commercial fishing, these creatures will be gone from our ocean. So here, here's the thing that's very interesting about, about shark fishing in the state of Florida. You have a group of fishermen who rely on sharks as part of their livelihood. It's a very small group of fishermen, uh, but they're very vocal. And we know when it comes to Florida tourism dollars, a live shark is always going to be worth much more than a dead shark. And a lot of people, a lot of divers especially, 
come to Florida with the intent of seeing a shark because they see this creature that they've heard so much about. They spend time in the water with it and they're changed. I mean, that's the one thing about a shark dive. Once you spend time in the water with a shark, your perception of them changes. Should you be removing this apex predator from the water and how can you do it in a way that's sustainable? Because, you know, if something can be done sustainably, that's one thing. But when you when you hit that tipping point where it's no longer sustainable, that's where you really come into the, the, the problem. The other, the other thing about uh, shark fins is the United States really needs to step up and just make sure we are not a hub for the shark fin trade. State of Florida needs to make sure it is not a hub for the shark fin trade. You want to end demand at the plate, or in this case, the bowl, but you really want to kind of disrupt some of these pathways. During my time living in Florida, I saw maybe a dozen uh, petitions on causes.com or the petition site.com calling on the state to ban the practice of shark finning within Florida. The problem is people wrongly believe that shark finning is a term that refers to killing any shark using any method for any reason. And it does not mean that. It refers exclusively to cutting the fins of a shark off at sea and discarding the carcass at sea. If a shark's carcass makes it to land, that shark has not been finned, even if the fins are later removed and sold. So what that means is there can absolutely be shark fins supplied to the shark fin market that are not the result of fin. Another common misconception that I've encountered in some of my uh, public engagement work is the difference between illegal and legal shark fishing and shark fin trade. There are people who wrongly believe that the word illegal means something that I would personally prefer not happen. If there's not a law against it, it's not illegal. That doesn't inherently mean that it's good. There are plenty of legal things that I think are pretty bad. There are plenty of illegal things that I think are not that bad. But illegal only refers to, is there a law or regulation saying that you cannot do this? And when there are lots of people in the United States who wrongly believe that killing a shark uh, is illegal, and it's not. The United States is one of the largest commercial shark fishing nations in the world, okay. largely quite well run, well managed and sustainable. Well, making it illegal to sell fins in the United States does not make it illegal to sell shark, to kill sharks in the United States. The fins that are harvested by U.S. fisheries are the result of well-managed, sustainable fisheries that are already happening, even if it becomes illegal to sell the fins. So this doesn't save sharks. It just affects what you can do with the dead bodies once they're already dead. There's this misconception that uh, there's a major loophole in U.S. shark conservation laws, which is phrased as, did you know that while it's illegal to fin sharks in the United States, you can still sell shark fins here? What a ridiculous loophole. It's That's not a loophole. That was the stated goal of the environmental community in the, in the 1990s. Uh, the problem at the time was not that fins are being sold. It was that the specific act of shark finning is unsustainable and inhumane. And the compromise position was allow the sale of shark fins, but require sharks to be landed whole. So that is wrongly perceived as a loophole. It was the stated goal at the time. The United States is responsible for about 1% of the global shark fin trade, which means that if you remove our contribution from the global shark fin trade, 99% of it is still happening. The United States has some of the most sustainable, well-managed shark fisheries in the world. Australia has some, Canada has one. NOAA, the U.S. federal government agency responsible for fisheries management, has what's called capacity building aid. And capacity building aid is when we look at one of our trading partners and say, hey, we buy fish from you, but your fisheries are not especially well managed. And that's a problem for us, but we can help. Here is money. Here is one of our experts you can borrow. Here's equipment uh, that we know works. Use this to make your fisheries more sustainable. And we use that to help make shark fisheries more sustainable around the world. But we can't do it if we're not allowed to buy the products regardless. There is a difference, both philosophically and legally, between saying, uh, here, or, or, or we would be more likely to buy your products if you cleaned up your act and made your, your fisheries more sustainable, and we'll help you do that, uh, versus what this new band is saying, which is, we're just not buying from you at all anymore, no matter what you do, which removes some incentive and resources to get that. 
you have your constituents and you want to all, uh, honor all your constituents, whether they are fishermen, whether they are divers, whether, whether they are environmentalists. And the way to do that is with good science because all conservation starts with good science. The single best thing that someone can do, especially if they're a U.S. citizen, is a few times a year, there are opportunities to submit formal public comments to the National Marine Fishery Service, to NOAA. And if a bunch of people who care did that, it could really move the needle. I want people to write in and say, I oppose Amendment 17C because of incon inconsistent considerations of this issue, and instead encourage NOAA to consider Amendment 5B. And there's no way you would know that, right? That's tricky. That's technical. That's jargony. So if you if people are interested in learning specific ways they can help, I encourage them to follow me on social media at Why Sharks Matter on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Whenever there are these opportunities to come in, I share them. But if you want to make if you want to vote with your wallet uh, and make choices that make a contribute to a healthier ocean for sharks and other marine life, then not eating unsustainable seafood is huge, uh, which can mean eat more sustainable seafood. Reducing your carbon footprint is huge for the environment. Uh, using less single-use plastic is huge for the environment. So there are lots of things that people can do. And you can also donate time or money to reputable nonprofit groups or local scientific efforts. It, it's gonna take state legislation, state protection. It's gonna take domestic protection to protect sharks. So, so at the congressional level in Washington, DC, and then it's really gonna take countries coming together again much like climate change it's going to take countries coming together to really protect these creatures if the science can help justify the decisions made at the state level at the national level and at the international level we will go a lot farther to help protect these creatures good science makes for good policy